So I think that there are two really quite fundamentally different kinds of spatial thinking. One of them is navigation, and the other is tool use. And comparing and contrasting them is actually, I think, an interesting enterprise, because navigation is a challenge that any species that moves around in the world has to you know, cope with. So we do it, ants do it, birds do it, you know, the birds, the bees, everybody does it, um, in the words of the Cole Porter song. And there are probably some important cross-species commonalities. There are also some important cross-species differences. You know, birds have a magnetic sense. We don't. It would be great to have one. It seems we don't. And so you can really look at it in sort of cross-species perspective and, and learn a lot. The other kind of spatial thinking comes into play and when we think about it in an evolutionary context in an important adaptive function, which is tool use. And this is where um, humans do something that most other species really don't. Um, I put up a little snap there of a chimp using a stick to get termites. And it's true chimps do that, and different troops of chimps do it a little differently. And there seems to be some degree of cultural transmission of that. But, you know, and there's a little something ravens do. And, but by and large, we are the tool-using species. And we don't just pick up a stick and use it. We craft things very laboriously. Um, you know, this uh, Stone Age ancestor is chipping away at stone in order to achieve certain ends. And so you have to think through the spatial relationships between the tool and the tool you're trying to make, between the tool you're trying to make and the function you're trying to achieve. And these are the kinds of things that must have been nurtured differentially in uh, Homo sapiens. Um, so both kinds of spatial thinking are used in everyday modern life. We have to figure out where to go. We have to put together IKEA furniture. Um, so both on the navigation side and on the tool use side, there's lots of things we have to do. Um, the sign there where it says where are the platforms and where is the lift, um, since it says lift, you'll know right away that it was in some country that used to uh, fly the Union Jack. It's actually, I'm told, I just got it off the internet, I'm told it's a sign from Melbourne born Australia. Um, but the main point that I want to make is that humans also use symbolic means to augment their spatial skills. So language is certainly one of them, but there's also arrows on this um, that have um, uh, somewhat iconic but also somewhat symbolic meanings. There's little icons where you can interpret, you know, this is where you go if you are in a wheelchair. So there's symbols that are um, broader than, than just language that we use. And spatial skills certainly seem, on the face of things, to be important in science, technology, engineering, and math. So this is just um, you know, a somewhat randomly chosen potpourri of um, images from various STEM disciplines. Um, you know, Watson and Crick, when they uh, discovered or you know, found out the structure of DNA, had to interpret flat x-ray diffraction images that came from Rosalind Franklin's lab and think about how they looked in 3D. Um, anatomy, angular momentum, um, engineering. And on the right, we have um, spatial distributions. So spatial distributions across maps can tell us a lot. In this case, it's telling us that the genes that help many but not all of us, to digest lactose, co-occur with archaeologists finding skeletal remains of dairy animals in sort of Neolithic Europe. So it talks about the co-evolution of genes that allow you to digest milk with the insight that you can actually round up these cows and keep them close and get milk from them. Um, a, a famous use of this kind of map was to find out that cholera is transmitted by tainted water. Uh, John Snow, someone's nodding, they know the Snow story. So you can make discoveries spatially that you can't easily make through other analytic means. It's true that John Snow could have looked at a list of pumps and a list of people, but by the time you go down this list and go down this list, it would be, he probably wouldn't have made the generalization that there was tainted water as easily as he could when he put it on a map. 
Now, this is what psychologists would call face validity. I'm saying, oh, spatial thinking is important in science and math, because hey, look at that stuff. Um, but I think you always have to go beyond that uh, to really say, well, you know, how do we know for sure that it's involved? So this is um, a, sim uh, a simplified rendition that I made from um, this uh, 2009 study, um, which is a report on an incredibly large and ambitious project that was started in the United States in the 1950s called Project Talent, which studied hundreds of thousands of American teenagers in high school and got them to do all sorts of cognitive tests and followed them over their lifetimes and found out who went to college, what did they major in, what careers did they go in, did they persist in those careers. And what these um, uh, analysts did, and I mean, these people now retired. They were in high school in their 50s, so we know what they did with their lives. So what these analysts did is to take out verbal intelligence, take out mathematical intelligence, mathematical aptitude, mathematical skill, whatever you want to call it, as assessed in high school, and see for spatial skill, after you take out all those other aspects of intellect, which definitely contribute to success, what predicts going into these various um, kinds of occupations? And if the bar goes rightward, then higher spatial skill in high school predicted those occupations. And you can see that engineering and math and computer science and then physical science are the highest rightward bars. Um, now, we have leftward education, and um, this is actually part of the problem because to the extent that people who go into K through 12 teaching are kind of low in spatial skills, that could be kind of an issue. <laughs> and I'll return to that a little bit um, later. Um, I think one has to cope with one's spatial anxiety in order to do a good job of incorporating spatial skills into the K through 12 curriculum. And we won't say anything about why the lawyers look like that, but <laughs> whatever. Now, what were the spatial tests um, that were used in Project Talent? There were four of them. Um, the one at the top is sometimes called a paper folding test or a surface development test. You have to take that flat image and imagine it being folded and say which of those five three-dimensional drawings could be made from the folded um, thing on the left. Um, the second one is mental rotation, although it's a two-dimensional mental rotation. You're only rotating these um, figures in the plane, and you have to say which of those choices could be made by a flat rotation. Then we have mechanical reasoning, um, you know, which way are the things going to turn when that thing, you know, the bar goes back and forth. And then we have an abstract reasoning test, which is very spatial in nature, though, because it involves um, form. So it's an analogy test, though. So, you know, the triangle is to the truncated triangle as the diamond is to the truncated diamond as the pentagon is to what? Now, I mean, I kind of, you know, talked you through it a little bit, but you have to choose one of those five as your selection. Now, the top three require what I would call mental animation or mental transformation. There's some sort of movement here, whereas the bottom one doesn't. Um, note that all four of them are focused on objects. They're not about navigation. So in terms of the distinction that I drew between navigation and tool use, this is not about navigation. Um, a separate talk would be about um, do the kinds of spatial skills that are involved in navigation have anything to do with STEM, but I'm not going to concentrate on that. I'm really talking about the smaller scale object-focused spatial skills that I think evolved to support tool use. Now, in terms of the um, issue of sex and gender, I think it's important to know that there are sex differences in two of these four tests, but there are not sex differences in the other two. So there are robust sex differences in mental rotation. Um, there are uh, not quite a standard deviation worth of difference, but they're getting up to two-thirds or three-quarters of a standard deviation. So a standard deviation is the difference between 100 IQ and 115, or 115 and 130. So if you're going about two-thirds, three-quarters of that, it's the difference between 100 and 110. It's the difference between, at the higher end, between 120 and 130. This is a 
real difference. It's big enough to make a difference in what you can do in the world. The mechanical reasoning also shows sex differences, even if, uh, I, I mean, they're actually a bit larger than the mental rotation ones. I think the mental rotation is a little bit more interesting than mechanical reasoning because it's easier to say, well, you know, boys play with gears, they, you know, make kinds of models, and, you know, it's just by the time they get to high school, they've done a lot more with these things, so it's really based on sex-typed activity. But the mental rotation is a little harder to explain away in that fashion. Nevertheless, it's very important to think or to remember that not every spatial skill shows sex differences. And in particular, not only does abstract reasoning not show sex differences, where you might say, well, that's very what psychologists call G-loaded. That means that there's a lot of just very general intelligence. You have to think in terms of analogical relations, and so maybe that's why not. But paper folding, that top thing, has never shown sex differences. And I mean, there are hundreds of studies. They've been meta-analyzed. And what's the difference between paper folding and mental rotation? I'm not going to tell you the answer to that, because I don't know the answer to that. But I think when anybody tells you, oh, there's big sex differences, you have to keep in mind, well, they're not across the board, and we don't really understand where they are and where they're not. So in terms of the project talent data, one of the things that we've been interested in in Silk is whether or not you can find similar kinds of relationships in children. So how soon do spatial skills start to contribute to children's success in you know, science or whatever? Uh, in little kids, you really look at math because the early science curriculum is more about make a leaf collection where the, you know, dig up your garden, oh, there are worms. You know, it's not sort of science. But you do start math in early elementary school. And um, what my colleagues at the University of Chicago found in this study, um, which actually I see I should have corrected it. It actually came out. It's no longer in press. Um, is that spatial skill um, at age five predicted approximate symbolic calculation. So you don't have to be exactly right, but you have to know that five plus three is, it's kind of eight, maybe it's seven or nine, but it's definitely not like 12 or, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a pretty lenient kind of test. It, it, it really taps number sense a little bit more than learning um, uh, you know, memorized facts. Um, and the spatial test is the one on the left, where you have to imagine those two pieces coming together and which of those uh, figures will it make when they are rotated and translated so as to come together. And what we found further in terms of mechanism is that the way this works is that success on the spatial test at age five predicts success on the number line. So. Uh, for little kids, it's just 1 to 10. Here's a 7, where do you put it? And little kids, really, they kind of know 1, 2, 3, 4, but then it's like, oh, and then they're all big. So it sort of flattens out. Like, whatever, 7, 8, 9, those are all really big. And then you can get the same thing a little older at for 1 to 100. So by the time you're in second grade, 1 through 20 is not too bad. It's nice and linear. But then it's like, well, above 20, those are big. <laughs> so what you're looking at is whether or not you have a sense of that linearity. And then you go to the approximate calculation, and it's really fully mediated by that. The thing that I think is interesting about this is that the number line is an incredibly spatial concept. So being able to put numbers on the number line is, is really very spatial. And thinking about a number line as being divided in half, I mean, you could cope with 1 to 100, but what if I ask you 1 to a trillion? You know, the first thing you might, okay, right, the midpoint is 500 billion, if I'm not mistaken, and then what? And, you know, so really try to give yourself some um, points to think about on that number line. Now, the gender differences that I talked about before in mental rotation um, are not only large, they begin early. There was a point in time when psychologists thought maybe they didn't start till adolescence, but that has turned out not to be correct. So on this test that I showed you items from before, um, at the age of four and five, um, Susan Levine at Chicago uh, quite some time ago showed that there are these sex differences. Now, I gave you the full distribution for a reason, because another thing to impo that's important to remember when we talk about sex differences is that any one girl is not guaranteed to be lower than some other randomly chosen guy. There's a lot of overlap in these distributions, even though these you know, differences loom 
on the one hand, large when you say three quarters of a standard deviation unit, and you can see that the boys tend to be higher than the girls, and the girls are a little overrepresented at the bottom. But look, even at the very top, and in fact those two bars are equal, there's lots of girls. So that's an important thing to remember when you think about it. <laughs> I don't know. You know, uh, Larry Summers got his reading list from Steve Pinker, so I think that was a problem. <laughs> that's true, as far as I can tell. Um, social class differences also begin early. So what this uh, graph shows you is, first of all, it shows you the sex difference that I mentioned before. This is on a composite of two-dimensional mental rotation and a map reading task. Um, so there are sex differences in the high SES and in the middle SES, although the middle SES is a little smaller, but it's significant. Um, but there are not sex differences in the low SES kids. So that's something to think about when we think about, well, what produces this uh, difference? I mean, any um, theory about causation, which I'll say more about soon, uh, would have to explain that. Uh, sorry, uh, I always forget who I'm talking to. The sociologist in back will know this. Socioeconomic status. So rich, middle class, and poor. <laughs> sorry. Um, is that what I put up here for the uh, poor kids, let's just call them what they are, um, is uh, data from the spring of third grade. And you can see it takes until spring of third grade before they're kind of in the ballpark of where the other kids are in the fall of second grade. So, you know, maybe they're a little higher by then, but it's about a year delay. And that's consistent with the kinds of delay that you have in, in verbal and in math skills. So it's not... Um, a privileged domain. Um, I do think the class differences may be a little less pronounced in spatial, but it's not privileged. Yeah? So is there any understanding of why the time difference is different Okay, so I mean, I think you can tell. Right. You can tell this as a genetic story, or you can tell it as an environmental story. Um, if, if, if you want to tell a genetic story, um, so a some people will say that you end up in a higher class to the extent that your parents have higher innate intelligence. Um, you know, you, I'm sure, can comment on this sort of social drift idea that you drift to the bottom because basically you're innately stupid. So you can try to say that the spatial skills help you to get into the higher class. Um, and then some additional factor explains the sex difference. You can also tell an environmental story, but then we have to know more about what in the environment um, nurtures this kind of thinking. Um, so I think, yeah, Go ahead, but then we probably should, because we could talk about this endlessly. Uh huh. Those were the trophy wives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there we go. That's one explanation. I mean, okay, so just quickly, to the extent that there are specific activities that um, boys do that nurture this kind of thinking that cost money then those are going to come out more to the extent that you have more money. Um, now, the sinister possibility is that you'll get sex differences in the poor kids if you give them the opportunity to develop their spatial thinking. And in fact, there is a study that I know that's ongoing in Atlanta with an after-school program that gave doses of spatial activity to poor kids that did the kids started not showing a sex difference. They were merely behind the rich kids. By the end, they had improved, but a sex difference appeared. So basically, the environment calls to your genes is what you know, the argument goes. You can't develop your genetic potential unless you have an environment in which to do so. So you can tell a genetic story also in that way. You see what I mean? You couldn't, you might be, you know, have the genetic potential to be, you know, wonderful at something that hadn't developed in your culture, wasn't available to you, and you would never develop it. Um, okay, so now the, the, the sex differences that I presented so far are not the only spatial sex differences around, and there is one other really quite robust one. Um, some of you will know that the middle photograph is photoshopped. 
<laughs> I hope most of you know that the middle photograph is photoshopped. Um, so uh, one of the tasks that may seem kind of funny in the spatial domain is to um, draw in a uh, a uh, tilted vessel like um, that that's a specially made beer mug that can has a flat sort of diagonally cut bottom so it can stay that way that uh, the uh, water or the beer in this case will be invariantly horizontal um, and that if the wine glasses look like that the water can't look like that um, women actually are poorer than men at drawing an invariantly horizontal line against this conflicting sort of field of the, of the frame of the glass. They're not way far off necessarily, although some are, but they're more than, you can set the criterion at say 5 degrees, you can set it at 10 degrees. They're more likely to be off by, I mean 10 degrees is a fair amount to be off on what ought to be that. And it works for the vertical too. If you ask them to draw a plumb line, say in a trailer that's going uphill, they're also poor at drawing it this way. They're also poor, um, we've discovered recently in my lab, at actually sensing the slope under your feet. Like, I swear this is horizontal. But if it was at five degrees, I would be less likely as a woman to notice this. I mean, I kid you not, undergraduate women sometimes don't even notice a five degree tilt, which is as much as our IRB would let us tilt because that's what wheelchair access ramps are tilted at. And they said, well, it would be dangerous otherwise, which I don't think is true, but whatever. But it's the wheelchair access ramp tilt. So it's not high heels. <laughs> We First of all, we did it when they were in, in paper slippers, but you could say, what's well, the history of wearing high heels? But we've recently done it in eight-year-olds, <laughs> unless they're already wearing high heels, which I hope to God they're not, <laughs> and it's still there. It's not high heels. But there's also another absence of a sex difference. So one of the things I was mentioning at lunch was that uh, we've uh, been working a lot with geoscientists. And geoscientists spend a lot of time thinking about you know, cutting into the earth and seeing what's inside. So we've developed some tests of cross-sectioning and um, started to give them to uh, quite a lot of both kids and undergraduates. And we're doing this more and more. And not a trace of a sex difference. So this is a pretty dynamic ability. Um, it's a STEM-related ability, and there isn't a sex difference. So you can't say that women have this issue across the board, and yet it does seem in some areas that there is a difference. Now, an important component in this story, um, and an important component of the center that I work in, is the proposition that spatial skills can be improved. Um, now, that applies to the ones without sex differences, like cross-sectioning. I mean, often when people are in introductory geoscience classes, it's, you know, everybody's bad. You want to make everybody better. So it can be important both for men and women for these things without sex differences. But in the case of sex differences, you also are interested in the idea of can you improve the women enough to help them to catch up to the men. Now, um, uh, so I, I wanted to tell you about um, uh, just one study in a teeny bit of detail and then introduce you to the overview. So the graph shows results from a study uh, by Terlecki and myself and Michelle Little uh, that was published in 2008 in which what we did is survey intro site classes at Temple. We just asked them actually interestingly if they played a lot of computer games or not because we had found that playing computer games is correlated with having higher spatial skill and we didn't ha have time to test their spatial skill. So we thought that way we'd pull out people who might be high or might be low. And then we um, had them come into the lab every week for a semester and do a mental rotation test. So this is simple brute force practice. Just do this a lot. And then also half of them we sent home and asked them to play Tetris and the other half randomly assigned we sent home and asked them to play Solitaire which we thought was a non-spatial game that still kept them on the computer. And we logged, they had to do this on a special website where they logged on so we knew that they did it. Um, so these are the uh, lines for three groups, men who are high initially, women who are high initially, women who are low initially. We don't have men who are low initially. Uh, first of all, not that many men 
as women take intro psych. And, but those who do, they all play tons of computer games. Men who don't play computer games are actually pretty rare. So we couldn't really, for whatever reason, I mean, but we really couldn't get that group. Um, what you see for both the high men and the high women is that they go up, and this is summing over um, Tetris versus Solitaire. For now, this is just brute force practice. They go up pretty steeply for about the first third to a half of the semester. Then they flatten out some. But that's not actually a flat curve, though. Both of those curves still have some slope. Um, so you can see that those are not. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> there we go. Well, it's kind of minified, so it's a little hard to see. But this was statistically tested. The low women do the opposite. At first, they're going up. But that is significant, but they're going up significantly more slowly than the two high groups. And then they inflect so that they're going up more steeply in the second semester. So what I think is important about this is not just that everybody improves, which is great, but also that the women who are low to start with are doing something that they're bad at. They're not getting much better at it. The only reason they're continuing to do it is because every time they come in and do it, we give them money that is <laughs> enough to buy your lunch. And so the point, and they wouldn't continue to do it otherwise. Um, but if you can somehow, and maybe not involve money, I think something you know differently motivating might work better uh, from the economic point of view, you get them over a hump, and they do start to improve more quickly. And um, that, I think, is interesting. Um, so uh, the story with durability is the gains are still there three to four months later. The story with transfer is not only is there transfer to other tests, not just mental rotation, but this is where Tetris did beat solitaire. Um, so if you played Tetris, you did better at transferring your skill to other um, situations. I actually think, by the way, that everyone can improve. The Wright et al. study, which I'm not going to show you the data from, um, Costlin is on it. He was at Harvard. It was done with Harvard students. My initial reaction was, they're going to get better. This is the most highly selected group in the country. Apologies to Penn. Um, they get better. They're not selected for this, which I think is a very important thing to think about for you guys right, who work with undergrads. Um, now, this new meta-analysis that David Utah at Northwestern is the first author of, which is uh, actually still impressed at Psych uh, Psychological Bulletin, um, showed really large training effects over the rather large training literature. And we divided it up by different kinds of um, spatial skills. So I've been talking about mental rotation. That's the second bar. The y-axis here is the effect size. So each of those um, decimals is of a standard deviation. So the top 0.8 is almost a whole standard deviation. That would be a big effect size. You can see that 0.2 is smaller. That would be a small effect size. These effect sizes are mostly in the moderate range. Um, but they're definitely there. They're definitely significant across many, many studies. They involve uh, perspective taking, a little you know, stimuli from that is on the left. They involve what's called embedded figures, disembedding, which is the ability to see the design on the left and the more complicated design on the right. All of it's trainable. The only difference is between disembedding and spatial perception. Um, that's the only significant difference. All of the other pairwise comparisons are not significant. So all of the, and disembedding is still significantly different from zero. So all of these can be improved. Um, now, in terms of sex, unfortunately, this meta-analysis, uh, for those of us who are interested in gender differences, does not support, as my old meta-analysis with Marianne Benninger did not support, does not support the idea that you can improve women's performance to the point where you eliminate the sex difference. There is still a sex difference. The two sexes go up in parallel. Um, now, the reason that I don't find this dismaying is because, as you could see from the prior graph, they're both still going up. Um, you would have to really reach the asymptote. You'd have to reach the peak of your performance. It might take women larger, uh, longer to re reach that peak, but maybe they would then be equal. Maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they would top off lower. But we don't know that, basically because we have never developed this skill to its maximum in either sex. So we really don't know if you could train out the sex difference. Now, this 
I think is a practically important point. Um, so this is a hypothetical graph, but it's constructed from real assumptions. So what you have are two normal distributions. Uh, one is labeled before training, and one is labeled after training. So you've shifted the after training normal distribution rightward, that is toward improvement, by as much as the meta-analysis told us you could, in fact, shift it. That's how much we shoved it rightward. Then we set a criterion of how good you would have to be at this kind of skill before you would enter one of those highly spatial STEM disciplines like engineering and computer science. And we base that on the project talent data. Um, so we establish a threshold that seems sensible given the project talent data. So what the light gray part of the distribution tells you is how many people would have the spatial smarts to make it in engineering and computer science if their skills had not been developed by some sort of training program. And what the darker gray part shows you how many more people would have the spatial smarts to make it in those disciplines had they gone through this kind of training program that we you know, know is available. And uh, you can see there's quite a lot of dark gray. You can perform a little mental integration. And it's a reasonable area, and you see that it could be practically significant. Uh, what we uh, would like to know is, and, and this is, I think, the next wave of research, is to do this experimentally. You do a randomized control trial. You assign some people to get spatial training, other people you don't give spatial training to, and you see whether or not their STEM performance, in fact, goes up. And this has been done, as far as I can tell, in um, four studies. Uh, one of them is really old, and I discovered it kind of by accident. And I thought, well, if it's so old, how come I haven't heard of it? There must be something wrong with it. <laughs> you know, it's sort of prejudice. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it, as far as I can tell. Um, it seems that spatial training actually did produce better grades in chemistry. A recent finding is that it produces better essays in geoscience, but of course you could assign grades to those. Um, uh, David Miller and uh, Diane Halpern at the Claremont Colleges found that it uh, got you better grades in an undergraduate physics course. And again, this is at the Claremont Colleges. I mean, we're talking so people who are already selected, but they're not selected for this. And Cheryl Sorby um, has shown that you get better grades in calculus. Um, Cheryl has also, some of you may know Sorby's work on engineering, in which she found that you get, um, that, that women who get this kind of class are more likely to persist in engineering more likely to graduate with an engineering degree. The reason that isn't on this slide is because that wasn't randomly uh, assigned. Uh, women who tested low got the opportunity to take a class, but they self-selected to take the class. So it's possible that women who wanted to do it were different in some way. Yeah? Is the training that was done in all these studies standardized in some way? Or is no. It no. No, I mean, there's much more to be done about what kind of training works better, and is there a kind that is more helpful for physics and a different kind for calculus, and who knows? Wide open. Yeah. think there are disciplines other than the classic STEM disciplines that take this kind of thinking, and in fact, fashion is one of them. Architecture is another notable example, which... Visual arts and performance arts were up on the top. Of the slide. Yes. The yes. Visual arts physical science. was between physical science and biological science. Right, and in fact, Ellen Winner at Boston College has some recent data unpublished as yet, um, which is not randomly assigned, but it has some nice correlational controls and you know whatever, um, suggesting that um, uh, uh, both men and women who do visual arts in high school have spatial scores that go up. Uh, they're higher to start with, so that may be why they're attracted, but then they go up differentially from like uh, other arts, like um, you know music and theater. 
Um, and there also are starting to be some experimental findings in children. So um, Kelly Nix at Michigan State has done a, a, an astonishing small study. I mean, it's really not a lot of kids, so I'm kind of amazed it worked. But she gave uh, some spatial training, and she found they did math problems better. Um, and David Grismer, who's actually at the University of Virginia, I don't know if you've met him, he's over there in the College of Education, has had kids copying designs in after-school arts programs in a truly randomly assigned pro uh, program with poor kids um, and found that they get better math scores if they're assigned to that. Um, so now I want to take uh, a little time to talk about the Larry Summers stuff. Um, are the sex differences in spatial skill, in fact, biological? And there's the idea, the first idea I want to take a little time to knock down is the idea that if it's biological, it means it's immutable or it can't be changed. And this is definitely not sensible. I mean, when you think about it, we change things that are biological all the time. You know, we're constantly, you know, like I'm genetically proposed, uh, you know, nearsighted, I wear contacts. I mean, <laughs> there are remedies for many biological problems. So I don't actually even understand this uh, kind of argument, but many people just make that sort of reflexive assumption. Um, and I, I actually sadly think the converse isn't true. There's lots of environmental problems that, well, theoretically we could do something about, but can we? So to the extent that poverty is the problem, uh, well, you know, the Bible says the poor you have always with you. Well, as a liberal, I'm not really willing to buy it. But so far, we haven't done a lot about poverty. So it just isn't a real correlation. The second idea is that it's supposedly predicted by hormonal or neurological evidence. And this is actually a dicey proposition I'm going to gloss over pretty quickly. But let me just say, the neurological data are really not there. I mean, in the olden days, people talked about, you know, women are more bilaterally specialized and men less so. And all of this or, you know, no, forget it. Um, hormones, maybe, kind of, sort of, there's something. I mean, when you look at these data, I think there's something happening because kids with various hormonal deficits sometimes have certain kinds of problems. There's, you know, certain kinds of fluctuations in women as, you know, result resulting from the menstrual cycle and so forth. But I'll get to this a little later, but basically the data are a mess. They're a mess. There's no slam dunk. If you have estrogen, you're bad. If you have androgen, you're good. It just doesn't go that way. So something is going on, but nobody has gotten to the bottom of exactly what. And you know, to really expand on these data would take me the whole um, you know, time I have and more. Uh, but it just isn't um, a clear argument. But what I do want to spend a little moment on is the idea that sex differences are predicted by evolutionary theory. Because I think this is actually not true. And it's not that I don't believe in evolution or I don't think that there's such a thing as putting us in evolutionary context. It's that the arguments have never been correctly spelled out. And when you spell them out, they don't work. Um, oh, this is what I already said. Um, so, um, you know, I'm fine on some hardwired sex differences. I mean, who's going to say, you know, mammalian lactation, that's hardwired, you know? And there can be some indirect effects. So the sex, sexual division of labor in societies in which women are always pregnant and lactating is going to follow from biology. In modern societies in which women are rarely pregnant or lactating, um, there can be different arrangements. So we really have to, you know, analyze this um, clearly. But there are two families of theories when it comes to thinking about evolution and sex differences in cognition. Um, one of them you can call man the hunter. And this is the one that I think the public most thinks about. They think, well, you know, men are the hunters. So, you know, you've got to follow the animals. You've got to find them. That's the tracking thing. You've got to aim your spear at them and hit them. That's the aiming thing. You've got to make the things with which to pierce them. That's the tool making thing. So it all has to do with hunting. And, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the sociobiology story is really generally more about um, sexual reproduction than it is about hunting. So it's only really about hunting insofar as the guy who brings home the largest deer might accumulate the most wives or something. But evolution is really supposed to work through how many genes you leave in the succeeding generation. So most sociobiologists who tried to tell this story have tried to say something about how you would leave more children in the succeeding generation as a function of fill in the blank, 
aggression, or in this case, it would be spatial skill. So the issue is whether we can make that story go through or not. But let's start uh, with the data that favor this. So there are some data that favor this idea, and they come from the bowl, which is a little rodent. Um, looks kind of like a rat, but somehow cuter. Um, they come in a couple of different varieties, and they're closely related species, but some of the species are pair bonded, and some of the species are not pair bonded. And the ones that are pair bonded have equal spatial ability. Now this is switching up a little bit, because how do you study tool making in a bowl, right? They don't make tools, remember? So now we're over to navigation. So we're over in a different area of space. Um, but they are equally good or bad at getting their way through mazes. The uh, polygynous voles, the males are higher in making their way through the mazes only during the breeding season. <laughs> well, they actually have a larger hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that supports navigation. So they grow a bigger hippocampus during the mating season, which enables them to find their way around. Because what the females have done is they've found a burrow, and they're defending their territory and waiting for someone to mate with them. And if you're a male vole, what you wish to do is make your way to as many females as possible before the other male voles so that you impregnate as many females as possible. So in fact, it is a navigation problem um, in this evolutionary context. It's the traveling salesman problem, exactly. Um, so let's back up to man the hunter. The problem is the kinds of spatial ability that I just told you about, especially mental rotation, don't actually seem to have anything to do with aiming. And people have actually tested this. It's not as if they didn't. If you do better at doing these mental rotation tests, you're no better at throwing a spear. Um, and I think that's because it's really a sensory motor skill, which has nothing to do with your spatial ability. Um, the problem with tracking is basically that the assumption, you make certain assumptions about what our ancestors did, um, which is that they followed animals for long distances and then had to get them and find their way back. And that gathering did not involve that. So the sort of mental images, you roll out of your hut, there are the berries you gathered, and, you know, that's it. But actually, as you know, if you've ever been out in a forest, you know, the mushrooms are here today, the mushrooms are there tomorrow, who knows where they are. You know, so there's a certain amount of you know, tracking and navigation involved in gathering. And on the hunting side, who knows how we hunted? We dug a big hole, then they fell into it. We went down to the lake, they were there, then we speared them. I mean, it's not clear that the method involved, you know, was the tracking. I mean, it just, people haven't thought it through is my point. And for tools, women make tools. I mean, this is a well-known anthropological fact. Um, sex type labor in most hunter-gatherer societies involves women doing pots and doing weaving. So as far as I can tell, that's just as spatial as making an arrowhead. So there you go. So now we get to the man who gets around, which is actually the social biology story. And here, I really think there's a big problem. You can a little bit leave aside the vexed issue of whether or not Homo sapiens is or isn't pair bonded, which I'm not going to touch. <laughs> we are kind of, sort of, almost pair bonded is basically the bottom line, but not perfectly. Um, but even say we weren't pair bonded. We live in social groups. No one is going to dispute that. So whatever the problem is for the polygynous man, say you have a harem, say you have four wives, say you're aiming for what these people call stolen copulations. The problem isn't finding the women. You know where they are. So it just doesn't work for our species. And I don't get why people don't you know, notice this. Um, I'm going to skip over the rest um, because what I basically want to say is that sociobiology is powerful, it's valuable. I don't think it's a terribly corrupt point of view. I just think it hasn't been thought through with respect to this problem. Um, and um, what I do want to get on to is, well, this is a point I already made, which is that uh, causation is not really, in any case, the most important question. I already said that. Uh, I want to say just a little bit about the more practical side. So one thing is the role of spatial anxiety. 
So teachers do turn out. I kind of alluded to this when I showed that leftward versus rightward bar graph. They do have spatial anxiety. And um, in work, this is also work at the University of Chicago out of C.N. Bialik's lab. And Bialik has done quite a lot of work on math anxiety. So she actually controls for math anxiety. Um, spatial anxiety is something you can assess separately. Um, it's correlated but not perfectly with math anxiety. And she finds that um, the spatial anxiety of the teacher is related to students doing better at the end of the year on mental rotation. So the fall mental rotation score regressed onto the spring mental rotation score for the students, not for the teacher. Um, so it's going up, um, but the high uh, spatial anxiety um, uh, teachers are getting that um, relationship at a, at a lower level than the low spatial anxiety teachers have um, a, a higher relation there. So this isn't before and after. This is the relation between the before scores to the after scores. And what you can see is that's constant across the low and high anxious kids. But what the low spatial teachers manage to do is displace it upward. Uh, with a questionnaire. So you just have to say, like, how anxious would you be if you have to put together your IKEA furniture, you know, on a scale of one to five or whatever. Uh-huh. What, what, what's the definition of teacher? What, what are you? Um, sorry, elementary school teacher. Right. Just across the board elementary uh, Well, it was a sample of um, Chicago public school teachers. Right. So it's elementary school in the Chicago public system. I mean, we don't necessarily know about the generalization, but... Now, this is, though, a hopeful story in that um, what they also have done in Chicago is to run some teacher work circles with, um, this is a small group, but a you know, group of um, uh, uh, 20 or so um, CPS, Chicago Public School teachers. And um, they get together during the summer, kind of like you all are, and they discuss what is spatial ability, why is it important, how could you develop it, what could I do in my classroom, for about a week. I mean, it's not an enormous intervention. It's not even all day for a week. It's part of the day for a week. And what you see is that before versus after the intervention, if you assess their self-reported anxiety about math or about reading, there's no difference. So it's not that these teacher work circles really made them less anxious across the board. What happened was specific to spatial. Before the intervention, they had significantly more spatial anxiety, and after they attended the teacher work circle, their anxiety was reduced. Now, you may notice we haven't taken the further step of seeing if the teachers whose anxiety we helped to alleviate subsequently got their kids to improve a bit more. That would be a great step to take. But we have the pieces here. Yeah? Is there any indication of these elementary school teachers in Chicago, the gender breakdown? They are all women. <laughs> I mean, I only wish some men taught elementary school more or so, but it's a pretty rare breed. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know this now that the experiment was about, but I was wondering about, you know, there are interventions, like you've been saying, about training students to improve their spatial skills. Um, so I wonder how much of an effect the teacher's anxiety would have. Suppose I had high anxiety, but I gave my class one of these interventions, right? So I trained them to do better. Mm-hmm. Do you think my anxiety would have any negative impact on the students if they're getting the training? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there is that potential, yeah. Still. Uh, that, 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 that you would in some way sabotage it. Oh. Right. Um, you know, just anecdotally, and this is with respect to math, one of the things that I was struck by when I was a you know, young mother going into the elementary school to kind of help out was that I was standing next to a woman who actually you know, has become a very good friend of mine. But she said, well, I don't want to help in math because I'm not good at math. And I remember turning to her. I kind of already knew her well enough to say this. And I said, Lori, 
well, there's lots of people called Lori, I guess, even in Lower Marion. I said, Lori, they're learning to add. I mean, so, you know, I think there, there's something to be said for really bringing it to ground. Uh, but potentially she would have sabotaged it. She would have communicated a certain kind of anxiety. I had a babysitter at one point who actually said to my daughter, um, I can't believe you like to do your math homework. Math is so hard. I mean, it's amazing what people say. My daughter reported this to me because she thought math was the best. But <laughs> It's like Barbie, I know. Right, right. Right, right. So I just wanted to wrap up with the argument in kind of overview that what I've tried to persuade you of is that spatial skills are important to STEM learning, that they can be improved, that the causes of the differences that we do see in gender are not well understood. The part of the puzzle is why in some areas, not in others, why in some classes, socioeconomic classes and not in others. Um, is it in any way biological, which I don't think matters, but it's kind of a matter of scientific curiosity. Um, it's just not well understood. But the important thing is that I think there's at least preliminary evidence that improving spatial skills could help, help to reduce gender and also social class inequities in the STEM pipeline. Now, having said that, the one other thing I want to say is I don't in any way want to say that this would be the only issue. And in fact, um, there are, you know, well-known arguments at this point about work-family um, difficulties being one of the big causes of women leaking out of the STEM pipeline. So I really would not want to overemphasize the importance of spatial skill. And I think in some ways it's more important early on and perhaps less important later on. Um, but um, I do think it's part of the puzzle. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so in this case, if we want to, um, let's say, apply that in environments that we teach, what would be your advice in uh, identifying um, the role of the special uh, skills and intelligence? Right. Um, so you, as I understand it, are high school teachers, yes. um, mostly of computer science, yes. but some of math. Is that correct? Um, so, um, I, I, I think that it's important to um, communicate, first of all, an openness to this kind of ability, a willingness to help people to work at this kind of ability, um, not shying away. So take, you know, um, if you're, you know, teaching functions and you're working with a graphing calculator and, you know, some you know, people, maybe some of them are girls, are resistant to that. So, well, that doesn't really help me. You know, one of the things that teachers talk about a lot sometimes is, well, some people are visual learners and some people are not. Some people are more language or linguistic or auditory learners. One of the things that psychology has made us actually very weary about is that claim. A lot of people say it, but it doesn't actually seem to be true um, that some people are visual learners and some people are verbal learners. It just isn't true. So don't let them tell you that and don't, you know, think it yourself. Um, one of the things I think is ironic, though, is even if it were true that some people were visual learners and some people were verbal learners, I don't think it would follow that the visual learners should only learn visually and the verbal learners should only learn verbally. Um, it seems to me important to nurture or develop your weaker side as well as your stronger side. Like, you know, if a pitcher in baseball has a great fastball, it doesn't mean he doesn't work at his curveball. Like, maybe you work more at your curveball if you're a pitcher because you want to have a balanced repertoire of pitches. So I sort of don't get the argument even if the premise were true. Um, I don't know. I could go on, but maybe that helps. Or, yeah. So to identify, just a few quick uh, if you want to identify these special learning styles or skills, that, uh, no, that no. The, uh, the SES should not be a factor here. No, no. The gender should not be a factor. No. So we have to work our way to eliminate or reduce that. Right. Bias. I would incorporate the spatial learning as a tool along with other tools. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, downgrade the other aspects of learning, but I would not differentiate it by gender, by class, uh, by claimed learning style, or by any of that. Yeah.
Yeah. You showed us data pre and post training for spatial skills. Has there been um, any scholarship on whether or not that training has more of an effect at different ages? So this room, this yeah. school, we actually teach. Right. And, and right. Graduate school, and so I'm, but you also showed elementary school data. Right. So we actually looked at this in the meta-analysis, and you might think that it would have more impact early if you had some sort of critical or sensitive period hypothesis or that kind of stuff. And a lot of our work is with little kids, so I was kind of hoping it would have more impact early. But that did not turn out to be correct. Um, now, there's a hint that it's true in the meta-analysis in that the bar for how big the improvement is for the kids is higher than the one for the adolescents or the, the, the adults. But it is not statistically significant, given the way we analyzed it. Now, this went through so many revisions that I can tell you there are other ways to analyze it where you can get it to be significant. <laughs> so I am not convinced that it isn't true. But what is true, I, I think, are two things. For you, the important thing is that it's not true that we're all like, that it's over by high school or over by college. It is so not over. In fact, I don't think it's over for me. I mean, there are studies with, you know, people of all ages that show that it improves at all ages. So I think that's the important thing for you. Um, the other thing, though, if I were talking to elementary school teachers that I would say is that I do think it's important to do from the get-go because even if it weren't differentially larger at the younger age, I do think you launch kids on a trajectory and there's some Something to be said for trajectory. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, you and then you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What, I don't know what spatial exercises um, would you recommend, I guess. Or uh -huh. What kinds of things would you recommend that improves learning, or where are they found? Right. Now, in, in little kids, and I know that's not your domain, um, I think they should be play. So, you know, to the extent that a lot of you are parents, you know, I'm saying, you know, blocks, I'm saying jigsaw puzzles. I'm also saying spatial language. Uh, so a lot of the effects that we found in little kids go through language. So as you're working with the blocks, you're saying, you know, this one is above the other one, or the jigsaw puzzles, you're saying, oh, does that have a flat edge or not? So you're using spatial language, and that's an important component. I think of what you do with the little kids. Um, as you get older, then I think what you're thinking about is um, incorporating spatial elements into the curriculum. So what I'm not saying is take your kids out and make them do mental rotation tests for a half hour a day. I mean, first of all, your school district would probably shoot you because you're not really allowed to do that. Uh, but also, it's a kind of indirect way of you know, improving their, you know, I mean, you're trying to teach algebra or programming or whatever you're trying to teach. Um, but you think about spatial ways to present the information. So, for instance, uh, with elementary school, I'm a big fan of the number line. You know, I think spatializing those representations is helpful. Um, with middle school, one of the things that the project that I'm on with Chris Massey has done quite a lot of in middle school science is uh, to work on the way diagrams are used. And this, I think, could be relevant, um, and I'm not as familiar with a high school computer science curriculum, but there's a lot of assumptions that diagram reading is transparent and doesn't need to be taught, and that's actually not the case at all, we found. Um, you do need to communicate to the students how to read the diagram, and um, then the diagram can be really very useful um, in getting information across. Um, we haven't done that in high school, either math or computer science, but we have done it in high school biology. Um, and uh, there are definitely some interventions that help with the diagrams. All have some experience with drawing pictures and solving logic problems. Right. And unless you don't want to talk about it yet. Um, no, it's fine by me. I think it's relevant. A lot of the teachers saw some of the logic activities they had. I'm going to give you a lot of logic activities on Friday, but in terms of like, yeah, it's like there's great activity how you teach people to draw pictures that, that I have or, you know, yeah. doing any kind of activity that's spatial activity is one with toothpicks. And you just do a little logic problem with toothpicks and how you have to arrange toothpicks and it makes it think at a different level. It's right. Different right. Level. But there's so many logic activity that involve just, you know, building something and doing something. Oh, well, that's great. Or even just watching the people solve that 10 card problem today where you have to deal with 10 cards and how some people put the cards on the desk and they separated like those odd numbers, the one, two, three, four, five, 
four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It was just interesting to watch, but yet yeah, all the web logic activities are just awesome for just getting people to see things differently and see things spatially. Right. The thing that I was, I was thinking of is an activity that Bob does that demonstrates very clearly the value of drawing pictures, making diagrams when you're trying to solve a problem. So active sketching, yeah, very important. Yeah, you wanted to ask. Uh huh. And so, uh, whatever the normal abilities happen to be, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, they really they they come and they do a time sheet to get there to earn the internship money, and they're there every half chance they get. As a matter of fact, I got to be very careful not to alienate the other teachers in the school because the girls will say, you know, I'm going to go just to my auntie's room and do an hour for the internship. So we're going to get paid for that hour. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering in my mind the difference between the intellectual capabilities or the, the gifts that people bring to the table and the necessity of how necessity changes these, uh, these situations. But the girls are in earnest and they're talented and they, you know, they bring their little kids into the computer program at the school. And the kids, you know, all of the kids and they'll be doing work with the yeah, so it's a real motivator. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Is there any difference between uh, uh, special intelligence and uh, two dimensions and three dimensions? Because most of the stuff we do are working right. two dimensions all the time. And you know, like when, you, when I saw the computer scientists sort of package for the engineers, I see engineers are very much 3D people. Like right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think more analyses should be done. And with hundreds of thousands of people in this database, you could do more. But um, 2D is basically easier than 3D, uh, for whatever that's worth. Um, nothing against computer science. The 3D stuff uh, in mental rotation is definitely more challenging. Um, so that's all I know about that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Could you say a bit about memory? Uh, I, know, I know it's an altogether different topic. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh. Right. Um, you know, there are very few gender differences in memory. Um, I, I mean, I can think offhand of you know a few little ones like uh, women have earlier childhood memories than men do. Um, that could be because they talk earlier. No one really knows how come they have earlier childhood memories, but there aren't many in just memory. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I wonder about um, actually working with young hands. So, for example, when you intelligence test where you do the mental rotation, would there be any difference between just practicing the mental rotation as opposed to doing something with your hands where you're working right. out with your hands? Right. So um, this is, again, with the little kids, um, because a member of our project is Susan Golden Meadow at Chicago, who does a lot with gesture. So they've uh, done training where the, those puzzle pieces that I showed you, where the kids are trained to move like that, or they're shown me moving like that. Watching me doesn't help you. Doing this does help you. So there is something probably about active stuff. Cian Bilek has done, this is with university students in angular momentum, an exercise where you either hold or watch another person holding two spinning bicycle wheels that are either spinning together or I always hate to do this in public because it's one of those <laughs> spinning the opposite directions. And you feel your task is to keep the two bicycle wheels against a line on the wall. And there's a little laser light that you can tell if you're deviating. So you feel the effort that it takes. And that vastly helps them understand angular momentum. So yes, there's a lot of embodiment here, too.
Yeah. Do you know about packages that are designed for high school or early college training packages? Yeah. Are they So Cheryl Sorby has um, a book that one can buy, uh, which she originally devised for these um, college entering engineering students, and that has been modified uh, for use in high school and even in middle school. Um, now, I think the data are not in about exactly how well it works, in whose hands how. Um, she and Lynn Libin. Uh, at Penn State currently have a grant from NSF to evaluate in a true randomized control study the success of this curriculum. But nevertheless, I think it's nice. It is commercially available. It does involve active drawing. Um, so it's something you might want to check out. I don't, but Sorby is S-O-R-B-Y and Cheryl is with an S. S-H-E-R-Y-L. Yeah. Wow, that right. she feels like that it actually has an adverse effect to keep those groups together when doing an intervention. And I'm curious to see what your thoughts on that um, I mean, you know, I guess that's, you know, her clinical experience. There aren't data to support it because she hasn't done it, I don't think, both ways systematically and compared and contrasted. Uh, but, it, you know, it makes sense to me. I think it is a little demoralizing to see people whizzing along when you aren't. So, I mean, I could understand it, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Early on when you talked about the correlation between spatial ability and math ability in five and eight girls, I think it was, um, you mentioned that it was largely mitigated through the number line. Um, do we know if that's causal? I.e., is it because we use the number line and they're bad at spatial, therefore they're bad at, there's this gender difference in math? Is teaching non-spatially going to avoid some of these gender differences? Do we know that? No, we don't know that. Um, now, I mean, what you're alluding to is what educational psychologists sometimes call aptitude by treatment or whatever interactions. So the idea is that you'll find effects of being high or low in a particular aptitude that are different depending on how you're taught. And that's similar to the learning style literature that I talked about earlier. Aptitude by treatment interactions make a lot of intuitive sense. They have mostly not been found. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. It's a kind of funny thing. They make so much intuitive sense to me as well as, you know, that it's hard to believe they don't exist. But I'm, you know, I always want to take it with an enormous pinch of salt given how hard they have been to find. So that's all I have to say about that. It's weird. All right. I think we could, uh, oh, great. Yeah. You all day. Right. <laughs> this is really interesting. Oh, well, thank, thank you. So much. I want to